We turn to Matthew 21 as we can almost getting toward the end of our journey through Matthew. And uh, today I want to kind of do a little comparison of this arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem and then the arrival that we will see in the future over in Revelation. So we're going to cover a couple of different areas today. But first, let's start in Matthew 21. As I've been telling you since the beginning of this study, way back in Christmas, we began looking at Jesus' arrival and, and the plan of salvation began to unfold. And today, we see a very integral part of that plan of salvation. Matthew has been trying to show us all along that Jesus is the King. But you remember as he would teach his disciples and he would talk to his disciples, he would even show them great miracles, but he would say, don't tell anybody about this. Because what? My time hasn't come yet. Today, as he arrives into Jerusalem, and usually we only hear this sermon on Palm Sunday or something like that, but this is what's happening. But today he is going to tell everyone that he is king. And it's amazing that what he is going to do is he is going to speed up the process of him being crucified. Because we have been watching this from some time now that the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders of the area were not very pleased with him. As a matter of fact, they hated him. And they wanted to kill him. And so he kind of held himself back. He didn't really push the issue. He didn't really say a lot about it. And that's why he kept telling his disciples and others, don't say anything about this. Don't say anything about this right now. There'll be a time. My time has not come yet, but my time's coming. And today, guys, we're seeing that time come. We're seeing him unfold that to us. And there's a lot of different feelings about it. There's a lot of people that are excited. Some are kind of going, man, this is kind of weird. And other people are just sitting back and just seething in anger because they do not like this guy. And still today, that goes on, doesn't it? There's still people that you name the name of Jesus to them, they get so angry. They don't want anything to do with it. And guys, it's not going to change in the future when he comes again. There's going to be a lot of people that want nothing but him to be dead. And so we're going to see that together. Let's look now in Matthew 21, verse 1. The king is coming. Think about that old song, the king is coming. I can see him coming. Man, what a great, great song. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Beth Page on the Mount of Olives, that's very significant because when he comes back in the future, that's where he's coming back to. Isn't it amazing? He's coming back to the Mount of Olives where they have the olive trees and they grow this, this olive garden here that they would press the, the olives and put it under much pressure to get the oil out. Go to the village ahead of you at once and you'll find a donkey tied there with her coat by her untie them and bring them for me if anyone says anything to you say that the lord needs them and he will send them right away you ever thought you might have something that the lord needs here we have the sovereign god of the universe we he is fully god fully man but he is asking this, this couple, this man, to give up his coat and its donkey because Jesus needs it. Let me ask you this. Is there something that Jesus needs from you that you have? Something he's gifted you with? Something he's given you a talent to do? And he's asking you to give that to him? You know, you think about this couple here and this, this little donkey had never been ridden. Trey could come up here and tell us all about them new coats and breaking them coats and all those kind of things. But it had never been ridden. This was, this was like a prized possession because not many people had something to ride. Most of us just walked. It's kind of like me and you have a brand new vehicle out there that we'd never dri driven. They just delivered it to the house and never driven it. And somebody comes by and says, hey, we need to borrow your car for a minute. Uh, this man down the street needs to, to ride in it. And he says, if, if they say anything about it, just tell them the Lord hath need. You look over in Luke, and you can read the story. It's a little bit more detailed in Luke. And he just said, okay. The sovereignty of the Lord. The, maybe he was a follower of Christ. But it's just an amazing little fact there in the middle of all this, this story that this man just says, okay, here. 
Is Jesus asking you today, I had need. I need something from you. I pray all of us could say, here it is. Just take it. Just take it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Zechariah 9, 9 is what is quoted here now. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you. The king is coming, gentle and riding on a donkey. And on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Now, why a donkey? Why this way? Why is he going to come into Jerusalem and, and announce his kingship this way? Well, the culture of that day, usually if you rode in on a big white horse, you was kind of determining and telling everybody, hey, I'm a victor. I've had victory. I've, I've defeated my foe. If you rode in on a coat, you were a king. You were... Uh, a prince of peace. You are coming in to declare that I am royalty. And by them laying their coats on the donkey and laying their coats in the, on the ground, that, it was, that happened way back over in kings and, and, and judges. And then Solomon come along and it kind of turned and people began riding other, uh, other uh, horses, more stronger looking horses. And then all, only the poor people rode donkeys since Solomon's day. And so you see here kind of a, a little micro picture of, of Jesus and who he was. He, yes, he was a king, but he wasn't coming as a victor this time. He was coming as a servant. He was coming and humbling himself so that he could be nailed to a cross so that you and I could experience and have eternal life. What a... What a what a change. What a, what a picture that we see here. And so he's, you see him kind of riding in. The Mount of Olives kind of set over here on this side of the hill, and then there was a big valley called the Kidron Valley. And then you would ride up, and then you would come into the big city of Jerusalem, and it had a big wall around it. Back in those days, every city had a big wall around it. It was for protection. And so he's coming down and riding back up and going back up into the city and riding down into the city, and the people get really excited. I think a lot of these people probably would have been his disciples, his followers. You know, as he went around, many people followed him. And as we read there after a couple miracles, it said, he said, well, if you really want to follow me, you're going to have to, to uh, drink my blood and eat my flesh. And, and that was just symbolic for saying, you're going to have to give up everything and follow me. You're going to have to let me be the boss and the, the Lord of your life. And these people had done that. Some people, it said in there in them same verses, and and many that heard that followed him no more because it was too much. I don't want to give up everything to follow Christ. But I believe these people that were so excited and that were laying their coats on the ground, more than likely, a lot of them were disciples of Christ. But also in that crowd, I believe there were people that wanted to be delivered. And not so much from their sins, but delivered from the Romans. And they thought, finally, finally, this is a symbol. We, we know this from the Old Testament. The king rides in on a donkey, and he's riding in on a donkey, and he's come to rescue us. And they're waving palm branches, and they're, they're shouting Hosanna. And Hosanna, if you translate that, is save now. Save now. And they're saying, help us. Set up this new kingdom. Set up this new political system and get us out of this mess. And Jesus hadn't come for that. He'd come to die. He'd come to pay the price for sins so that you and I could rest in the promise that Jesus will save us. And there was, all, there was other people in the crowd that were just setting off and ridiculing. What kind of king is this? Where's his army? Where's their swords? Where's all the plunder that he's, you know, back in those days, if you went out and fought a war and you won, you brought all the gold and all their jewelry and you just took everything they had and brought it back as your own and, where, where's all the plunder? Where's all the, where's all the great stuff that you should have? This is no king. This is, this is a guy from, from Nazareth. There's nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And they still were blinded to who this was, why he had come, why this was such a big moment. 
Guys, this is a big moment for us because he is announcing to this part of the world that I am king. And guys, only this king could die for us. Only this king could pay the price for our sins. Only this king could bring salvation. And today as we read this, we realize that the plan of salvation was unfolding right before our eyes. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Think about this, this little one. It had never been ridden. You jump on a horse that's never been ridden, usually it's going to throw you. It's going to throw you. And here, as he sits and brings that mother, mother uh, donkey along beside of him, it kept that little one calm, but also I think that that little donkey knew who was riding on his back. He knew that he had created him. He is, he is ruler of all. He is ruler over all. And Jesus sits on that little donkey for the very first time, and that little donkey is calm and cool and collected, and he lets the king of kings ride on his back because he knew this was his creator. Isn't it amazing that animals can get it and people can't? Isn't it amazing that we hear in the scripture that if you don't cry out, the rocks will? Can you imagine a rock just start speaking and praising God because we won't? I believe with all my heart that donkey knew exactly who was riding on him. God had created him, and he got it. But there was a whole bunch of people in that crowd that had no clue what was going on because they were so blind that they could not see. A very, loud, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! Remember, that means save now. Get us out of this mess. Save now to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? You remember way back over in Matthew 2 when we read it? You remember when the, the Magi, the wise men came to, to Herod? And it said, and Herod was disturbed. Herod was troubled. And the whole community was troubled with him because when the, high, when the high king was troubled, so was the whole community. But here we say that they're stirred. Something's stirring in them. Something's rising up in them. Something's convicting them, I believe. And it's coming down to that question. Do you believe this is Jesus? Do you believe this is the one that can save you? Do you believe this is the one that's come to save you from your sins? And some are trying, they're dealing with that question, just like some of you are dealing with that question in here this morning. We deal with that question. That is a real question. Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Do you believe that he came and died for your sins? Do you believe that you even have sins that need to be died for? Some people believe, hey, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good girl. I, I don't cause much trouble. Yet the Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And they were stirred within. Something was happening here. Something was stirring their soul. And some of them couldn't get it. Some of them couldn't feel it. Some of them couldn't understand it. And some of them were just wrapping their arms around it because Jesus had come to save them. And they understood fully what it was about. Mm. What an amazing time. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They're still trying to figure it all out. The prophet. He was much more than a prophet. He was much more than a good teacher. He was the king of kings. And he was the Lord of lords. In one, in one way, this crowd was glorious. They were praising the Lord. In another way, this crowd was going, hey, they're kind of ridiculous out there, as I said earlier. Where's victory? Where's your army? Where's your soldiers? No sword. No victory that I can see. They were trying to make God who they wanted him to be. In essence, all they wanted to do was for Jesus to deliver them. And really, if we're honest, that's what we want. We want Jesus to deliver us. Because this world's a mess sometimes. And it seems to be getting worse.
I think about what happened over in Luke. This isn't up on the screen, but I want to, I want to read this to you because I want you to see Jesus' heart. And I want you to see as we move into Revelation. You can be, you can be turning over to Revelation 19 if you want. But over in Luke 19, if you want to turn there with me, I think about where Jesus was at this time. Listen, remember that he was sovereign, which means he knew everything that was going to happen. He knew why he was coming into Jerusalem. He knew what would happen five days later. And it isn't amazing that today they're praising him and saying Hosanna and save us and all those things, and just five days later they would be going, take him away, crucify him, crucify him. How fickle we are. How quick we change when things don't go our way. We're still guilty of that today, amen? Luke 19, 41 says, As he approached Jerusalem, same story here, but in Luke, and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. He's praying over the people of Jerusalem. He's come to die for them and he knows, since he knows all, that the people of Jerusalem, very few of them are going to get why he's come. Very few are going to understand why he dies. Very few are not going to believe that he rose from the dead. And he said, if you would have just, if you would have just called on me, I'd have took care of you. But he said, you've turned your head. And, and this was that point in time where Jerusalem kind of got set over on the shelf almost. It, it was time for them. They weren't going to accept it. And Jesus knew that. He knew that something much deeper would have to happen before it would move them to a place of salvation. Let me show you where that happens at. Turn over to Revelation 19 with me. We see the king arrive in Matthew, and we see the king arrive once more, his second coming. You know, a few weeks ago I was talking to you about the rapture, and I was talking to you about the seven years of tribulation, and I was talking about you what would happen during those times, and at that three and a half years, the Antichrist would stand up and, and he would proclaim he's God and worship me and, and he would start putting Jews to death and, and it would just be, the Bible says, the worst days ever known to man. And so this happens right at the end of that seven years. And I'm telling you, the Jewish people are in the very same predicament they were in Matthew 19. Where were they? They were screaming out, save us. Because at this point, the Antichrist has taken over. The world has come to the doorstep to take on Jerusalem, to kill the Jews, to kill the Antichrist. And all of a sudden we look up and we see Jesus coming on the clouds. The lamb and the lion. Look with me now in Revelation 19 and verse 11. I saw heaven standing open. Guys, get this in your mind. This is Jesus coming back to this earth, okay? I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. Remember when I told you earlier that the victors ride? They ride a white horse. He's not riding a donkey this time. He's not coming as the Prince of Peace. And people don't like that. They, they like pictures of Jesus that are peaceful and meek and, and broken down, and, and, and so they can make him what they want him to be. But I'm telling you, next time he comes, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Jesus and he is Lord, and there is no way you're going to get around that but the Lord the world likes that but then they you know when you talk about him being a judge when you talk about him being in charge when you talk about him taking on and destroying evil oh they don't they don't like that picture of Jesus because they can't make him what they want him to be they like to keep G Jesus meek and mild and and that baby in a manger but they don't like to see him on his throne high and lifted up and ruling with an iron scepter, which he will someday. Because right now, everybody says, well, why is he so mean? Because right now, we're living in grace. Right now is the time to come to Jesus. Right now is the time to come to salvation. 
He is offering and offering and offering. For 2,000 years, he's been offering salvation. He's been offering grace. He's been patient. He's been kind. He's been merciful. But guys, when this happens right here, it's going to be a whole new day for those that have turned their back on Jesus Christ. Please, please hear me this morning. Do not turn your back on Jesus. Do not be afraid to give your heart and life to him. Do not let people scare you away from doing what you need to do. You stand up for Jesus and it will be worth it. It will be worth it. I saw him, heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. What does that mean? He's going to keep his promises. You know what he's told us? He's told us he's coming back. You know what he's told us? He said, you can have a place in heaven if you'll give your life to me. He's going to keep all those promises. But he's also said, if you turn your back on me, you will be judged. And I loved what Danny said earlier. Do you want to stand before Jesus someday and in your place stands the perfectness of Jesus Christ? Or do you want to stand before God someday and be judged on you and who you are and on your sins? Because I'm telling you, that second way, you lose every time. But I'm telling you, when you give your heart to Jesus, the Bible tells us someday when we get before Jesus, he won't judge us on us because that sin will be forgiven. That sin was put to death on the cross. That sin was forgiven forever. We will stand before God and he will look at us and see his son and he will say, well done, enter into thy rest. Come on in, welcome to heaven because you have accepted the work that Jesus Christ, my son, has done. Man, that's big. Don't miss that today. That's big. Everybody's heard that so often, and they've cheapened that, and they've, they've broken it down, but that is our salvation. That is the promise, because he is faithful and true. With justice, he judges and wages war. How did he come the first time? What did we just read? Meek, mild, as a suffering servant, with, with grace and mercy. He won't come that way next time. He won't come that way next time. Because now he's doing that. He's doing it now. Well, why, Brother Todd? Why won't, he, why won't he be graceful and merciful in the future? Because he's doing it now. Now is the day of salvation. But he's going to come. You don't want justice. All right? None of us want justice. We want mercy. We want mercy. That's what he brought the first time he came. He's not bringing that the second time. Because now is the time. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. My goodness. Guys, he can look into your heart right now and he knows exactly what you're thinking. He knows exactly what you're battling. He knows what's in your heart. He knows why you serve. He knows why you don't serve. He knows why you keep your word. He knows why you don't keep your word because his eyes are like a blazing fire. They light up everything about you. There are no, no dark corners. There are no secret places. There are no hiding places when Jesus lights up your life. He knows everything you're about. You better not try to fool him because you're wasting your time. Blazing fire. Judgment. On his head are many crowns. What crown did he wear the first time? The crown of thorns. He won't be wearing that crown. He's wearing many crowns. These are what they call the diadems. It means he is king. This is not the, the Stephanos crown. This is not the crown of an achievement or you did good. This is the king, the diadem. Crown him with many crowns, as we used to sing. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. We're never going to know everything about Jesus. There's people spending their whole life trying to figure out every jot and tittle of the Bible. Understand what he allows you to understand, but also understand this. He is king and he is Lord, and we're never going to understand him all. A lot of people believe that maybe on his thigh is, is the letters YWH. YWH. I think there's one more letter in there. Let me look. Hold on. It just went away from me. Oh, I hate being forgetful. YWHW. YWHW. This was his name, but where we get the word Yahweh from is because people couldn't even, they were, they were too overcome to even say his name and so they took those letters of his name that he pronounced himself as these letters that no one really understood and they made that into kind of a name and they began to say Yahweh and then they felt guilty of even saying that name and they began to use the word Jehovah 
That's where we see those Old Testament names, Yahweh and Jehovah, because they didn't feel worthy to even speak the name of Jesus out loud. And he says he's got a, he's got a name on him that no one understands. We just don't understand all about God. Verse 13, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Some people argue whether that means his blood that he shed on the cross or the blood of his victims, the blood of his, his ones that he's conquered in the battle. Could be even our blood. Could be the blood of martyrs that have been given. But I, I believe it's the blood that he's shed for us. But I also believe that he is going to be victorious. The armies of heaven were following him. Who is that? That's everyone that's ever believed in Jesus. You notice what we don't have in our hands? Read with me. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses. What does that mean? We've been victorious too. How have we been victorious? What have I brought to this? I went through the blood of Jesus. That's how we'll be victorious. It's not because us. It's not who I am or you are. It's because you've given your life to Jesus. We are victorious through Jesus Christ. Then what does it say? Riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean we have no sword we have no weapon no spear all we have on us is white clean clothes what does that mean that our sins have been forgiven by the blood of jesus christ wow we will stand before him in perfection because of what jesus has done for us you talk about grace you talk about mercy he is pouring it out on us right now guys and someday, the only, the only ID we'll need, the only badge we'll need, the only social security number we'll need will be those fine white clothes that we got on because they're going to tell everybody that he has forgiven my sins, he has saved my life, and I am going to dwell with him forever and ever and ever. Man, what privileges we've been afforded through Jesus Christ. What privileges we've been given through the blood of Jesus, for all those that will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 15, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword. And it's not like a sword like we think, cut him up sword. It's the truth of his word. That sword is which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Everybody say amen right there. Mm. The truth of his word, that's his, that's his weapon. What, what is that truth of his word? What does he tell us in his word? He tells us that there's no other way to heaven except through him. He tells us that everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He tells us if you, you reject him, if you choose not to follow Jesus, if you choose not to give him your life, you will perish. You will not spend eternity in heaven with him. The truth of his word, it's, it's being proclaimed day in and day out. People are reading the Bible. People are preaching the word. You are reading your Bible. You are seeing the truth of his word proclaimed day by day by day all you have to do is says yes I believe what this word tells me and someday those that say no they will be judged by that same word because he has laid it all out pretty clear to us but there's no doubt there's no well I don't know if I understand it or not it's very simple he's made it simple for us he knows I'm a simple-minded person he knows you're a simple-minded person he knows that we get confused real easy and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody's going to heaven except through me. That's pretty simple. That's one way. There's one way to heaven. Just one way. You can't make up some alternate way. You can't go any way you like. You can't just make up a way. It's one way through Jesus Christ. He's telling you that today. He's telling you that through his word. And guys, there is no other way. There is no other way but through Jesus Christ. And anybody that tries to make up their own way, they're going to be sorely, sorely wrong. He's made it easy. He's told you what he's going to do. He's already shown us he's come the first time. He went to that cross. He put himself on the cross for you and I so our sins could be forgiven. He was risen the third day 
for the approval of the Father, said, yes, he did it just right. Your sins have been forgiven. Now all you have to do is believe in my son. And he's been preaching that through his word, through preachers, through teachers, through grandmas and grandpas and moms and dads for thousands of years now. And all you have to do is say yes to Jesus Christ. And if you don't, someday you will face his wrath. And I'm telling you, it's a bad thing to fall into the hands of an angry God because he is, he is putting forth his, his grace every day right now. He is loving you. He is showing mercy to you. He is blessing you. He is trying everything in his power to bring you to the saving knowledge of him. And it's whether you decide to do that or not. And at the end, you'll have nobody to blame. You'll have nobody to say, well, I watched their life, and that, I thought I was just as good as them. That's not going to cut it on the day of judgment. He's going to say, I need to know one thing. Is your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? If it's not written in there, it says, And those whose name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life were cast into the lake of fire, and you will dwell there forever and ever in eternal punishment, and you will burn forever and ever, and you don't have to. You don't have to. He's not an evil God. He's not a sadistic God. He's not a God that likes to kill people. But I'm telling you, He'll, he'll give, and he'll give, and he'll give, and he'll give, and he'll show grace, and he'll show grace, and he'll show grace. But on that day, when he closes the books, it's all over. And so don't wait another day. Don't say, I'll figure this out later. Don't say, I'll talk my way out of it. I'm a pretty good talker. I think I can convince God that I'm a pretty good guy. He's already told you the way. There won't be any other way to get into heaven. And he's standing at the door knocking and asking you to let him in. What will you do? He's proved himself over and over and over again. Guys, we, we make this really complicated. We want to make him who we want him to be. We want Jesus to fit in our box. And I'm telling you, he's never been made to fit in any box. And he never will fit in any box. Because he is the mighty, almighty king. And someday we're going to see him in all his glory. And I'm telling you, you want to be on his side. You don't want to be on the losing side. I don't like losing. I got all kind of nervous the other night. I thought we was going to lose to Hoxie. We didn't need to be beat by Hoxie. And when we won, I felt so good. And I'm telling you, when we stand beside Jesus with victory and waving those palm branches and realize that we have total victory in Jesus Christ, there won't anything in this world mean a hill of beans to you at that time because you know that you're going to be home and you're going to be free, and you're going to be standing in the presence of the Lamb of God. And guys, there will be no better feeling than that in all of creation than to be with Jesus Christ. And I want everybody in this room to go with me. Because you can. Because he's made it way. He's made it possible. Don't doubt anymore. Today is the day. Let's pray. Lord, you've come once. You've shown us who you were. Lord, you came and you died for us, and Lord, you were going to come again. And Lord, I want everyone in this room to go with me. Lord, not because I'm a great guy, not because I'm better than anybody, but because I know you. And Lord, there's a lot of people in this room that know you as Savior. But Lord, I pray this morning, if there's anybody in this room that doubts for one minute that they're yours, that they would get that right today. Lord, we can be 100% sure because of your promises, because you are faithful and true, and you have promised everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord, speak to hearts. Stir hearts today. Stir hearts just like you did that day in Jerusalem. Lord, convict hearts and let them see you. Don't let Satan blind them. Don't let Satan blind them anymore. Let them see you for who you really are. In your precious name we pray. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you have prayer requests, need to contact us, or need directions to the church, check us out online at fbckaiser.com. If you want to join us, we're located at 210 East Main Street, or give us a call at 870-526-2604, or send mail to P.O. Box 306, Kaiser, Arkansas, 72351. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks again for joining us, and may God bless you.